director Gideon Pizza Ra, the outlaw of filmmakers. Gotcha. I'm gonna call you Outlaw Filmmaker for the for the heading because Outlaw Filmmaker sounds kind of cool, you know, kind of Texas Western, you know, just to shorten it for the the um just for the title. But so that's his whole title. We met at the Houston Horror Film Festival back in July. Yeah. You made it sound like a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like it. Like two months ago. <laughs> like, does it feel like it was two months ago, or am I tripping? Does it feel like it was a while Damn, ago? Time, time is going by so fast. Yeah. 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 And uh, so Chantel, uh, so I just met you. Chantel didn't have a chance to meet to meet you. So tell us about what you do. You know, a little bit more in depth. Okay. Well, um. I've been in the entertainment industry, let's say about 16 years, you know. Um, I've been doing uh, film uh, for about six or seven years. And so this is like maybe my 13th project. Um, I do documentaries, feature films, um, short films. I started off doing music videos. So I mean, I'm diverse in almost every department you could think of when it comes to filmmaking. And uh, I call myself the outlaw because, you know, um, I had to take chances. Nobody gave me a chance. Nobody would even tell me what to do or how to start off being um, in the film industry. Even simple questions like, um, you know, where do I buy the cameras at? They look at me like I'm like I got to be a, a part of a secret covenant in <laughs> order to know the answer to these questions. So, you know, I was like, all right, cool. I'm jumping over gates and getting my shots. I'm going to talk to this person. I'm going to hire this person. I'm going to move however I need to move to get my shots. And so, um, by doing it that way, ask for no permission, doing it my way, I've been able to um, get my stuff shown in theaters, on the screens, pack houses, sell out multitude of my, my films and everything else. And so um, it's bringing me to the point where I am with it right now, um, progressing into other genres, such as the horror film genre. You know? Nice. Good for you. I love that. That is a can-do spirit. And I remember I was reading something earlier in this black screenwriter group on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, the guy's name is Jeff, and I can't remember his last name, but he went into depth saying the best thing you could do for yourself if you want to get in into filmmaking right now is get your camera out. Don't worry about having the, the best equipment, the best anything, and just start filming and get a hit show on YouTube or wherever. Just get the people watching, get your numbers up, get like 100,000 views, spread the word, and people will flock to you. You know, the high, you know, the people, the powers that be will come find you and look for you. So kudos to you, Gideon. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. You know, it's initiative. It's actually like it's so many different routes that a person can go to 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 move in the industry. So, you know, with the brother you just described and myself, we actually got go, go, going the hard nose route, you know, the, the hard knock route. But it's so many other different routes that um, a person can go. Um, but if push come to shove and you're back against the wall, you go out there and you use whatever little small things that you can use and bring something about of like film with what you have. Right. You know, and that's the best way to do it. Sure. I saw, I saw that it said on your profile that you were in L.A. Did Are you living in L.A. and filming there or are you living here in Houston? So I'm actually um, um I'm from Atlanta, you know, I'm, I'm from everywhere. Montgomery, Chicago, Atlanta, I'm from everywhere. <laughs> but um, I'm actually moving from Atlanta to go to L.A. So I've just been doing a lot of uh, flights back and forth to L.A. and getting ready to really fly internationally, but um, getting ready to set up shop in LA because believe it or not, that's where you need to be if you want to do this film thing, sure. I've heard, I got to come back to that, but I, I got to stop because you know, I get long winded. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Chantel. I'm going to shut it up for a second so you can get a word in. Chantel is here in the flesh. I am just yapping because that's what I do. I'm sorry, I'm going to back up and I'm going to come back to that, okay? What's hey, up? Chantel Renee. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, you're definitely making the right move, man. I mean, LA is where it's at. I mean, but Atlanta has really blown up the past 10 years, too. Most definitely. Most definitely. And, um, you know, uh, 
every city, especially when it comes to this entertainment thing, has its own ups and downs, ins and outs, uh, secret clubs, if you will. So, I mean, after you've been there long enough and you kind of mastered it, you know, it's peak. And then, you know, you have to keep graduating and moving on. So well, you're moving into the Viper pit over there, my friend. Oh, I know. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> L.A. is no joke. But I can, no. handle, I can handle it. Handle it. Um, so do you have a crew already set up there? Or are you, you starting all that from the ground again? Um, Actually, I'm in a very weird position. I am in a position where I'm half indie, half mainstream. It's, the, it's like I'm a... a, a, a Famous unknown. <laughs> the weirdest <laughs> position in the world. Because you got product out there and, and people know you, but you haven't really reached a certain threshold. So um, on this journey, I've, I've learned that some people are keepers and other people are sweepers. So I mean, like, I may have started with you from the beginning, but you got to be able to keep up, which means your 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 skill you got to shape up your skill you have to shape up your professionalism things that might have passed two or three years ago can't fly when you go to other levels so um that's where i'm at right now so i'm 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 watching them and they know i'm watching them to see if i'm gonna keep these two and sweep these other five and hire these other ten so that's where i'm at with it for sure what's what's the biggest project you've worked on so far Oh, like as far as people and days filming and all that sort of thing. Wow, um, the biggest project so far because I've 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 actually done at least at least three. Um, but I guess my biggest one so far I would say is White Folks the movie. It's called White Folks, but people know it's White Folks the movie, you know. Um, and I dropped that in 2017, and with that project I was able to really do some incredible things. I got it shown at the um, the Chinese theater in, in um, LA. Yeah, that's big. Um, Jamie Foxx people got a chance to see it. Method Man's people got a chance to see it. Um, and I was able to, through that project, learn a lot about the industry, but I also got to meet a lot of different people from the underground to the mainstream. You know, mm. so that's, I think to date, that's probably my biggest but I've also had other projects where they were pretty nicely financed, like the horror movie I just got through doing. And um, what's I'm, it called? The movie. Uh, you just well, this proof of concept is it's starting off as a proof of concept that I'm going to branch out into a horror movie called feature called Tits and Zombies. Tits and Zombies. So, okay. but it, it's starting off as a proof of concept called Terror and Tits of Town. And so that's what I've been promoting. I've been going to the, the horror film festivals, promoting this, talking to different people, and um, behind the scenes, talking to different investors and production companies to get it financed into the film, the feature film version. Yeah, that's okay. what I want to talk about a little bit. What's your budget for that? And how are you coming, how are you getting your funding, if you don't mind talking about it? Okay, so um, you said how I'm getting my funding for the feature film, or how did I get it for the proof of concept? For the feature film, for the you okay, you you're moving from the concept to the the actual film for the feature. So, what is your budget, and how are you reaching your budget? Well, um, there's so many different rights, routes I could have taken with this. I look at each project like a baby, just like it's really like birthing a child. So each project is going to be different. It's going to tell you how it wants to be treated how it wants to be released to the public, in other words. So with this project, we doing a proof of concept. Um, I decided not to go the, what you call it? The, uh, dang, what you call it? The um, crowdfunding route. Okay. I mean, I could have did that, but I learned from, my, from doing it last time that you really got to have a good strategy, a good team. Yeah. I wouldn't doubt that you got to have some good money to do a good crowdfunding. I don't know. I just never been successful in it. So okay. I've done other routes by um, pushing a hard promotion, looking for specific people. Like I know exactly who I want to go to, what kind of people that I need to go to, because the, the film is a controversial film. It's it's a it's a wild film to to be um, 
you know, general with it. You know, it's not your regular horror type of joint. I mean, we going in in the script. <laughs> so I need to go to a specific person. A rene I need a renegade. I need people who like to go against the grain, who like to drop stuff that bucks the system. All of that. So I know who I'm looking for, and that's the route I decided to go with it. You got my okay. attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We got these about six to ten million budget for okay. a budget. Six to ten million. I can live with, with that. Okay, so it has a lot of, uh, does it have a lot of special effects? Yeah, and my special effects team is killer. Killer. Oh. Ain't nobody messing with us. Ain't nobody messing with us. Uh, they've been tested, too, to see how well they could do with just a little. And what y'all have seen on Instagram and in the trailer, we did that with a bare minimum. Killing these, punishing these boys. You know what I'm saying? So I know what my special effects teams can, team can do. That's awesome. And, um... Huh? Is it rated R? It's, it might be rated NC-17. <laughs> We're not through rated. <laughs> it's a it's a um it's a very highly sexually explicit film. Um, it's like a combination of Twenty Eight Days Later, um, Dust to Dawn, and like something from Traumaville. Like, oh, uh, okay, yeah. So, um, I'm building up the old concept of the video nasties that came out in the early and late '80s. Yeah. So um, the whole film is just um, about a super wild VIP Hollywood party that turned out to be the darkest nightmare that these four exotic dancers could ever imagine. So um, yeah. it starts off really fun, like a hood movie. Then it goes into a, a, a sexual party or sexual theme movie. Then it goes into a horror. Then it goes into a terror. Then it goes into a what the fuck? I'm ready to go home. I'm so scared. Why did you make me watch this movie? It <laughs> flows down that timeline. <laughs> nice. Wow. I'm I'm really really like wanting to see it like right now. <laughs> What's up? Yeah, like right now. I want to see it. Well, tell the world. That you <laughs> finance. Hey, we doing it's our something. part. We doing our part. We talking yeah. about it. Yeah. We, we put it out there in, in the. Well, uh, I mean, yeah. Waves. You'll find someone, I bet, to finance yeah. it because it sounds, especially since you're like trying to use the the late '80s. You know, the TNA is a big thing in horror, mm -hmm. and I think um, a lot of people love to to kind of bring that out because I mean, nowadays everything's so PC, right? It's like yeah. you got to be real careful how how and what you say and what you do. Um, what do you do? Like, I, I don't know if in your in your past uh, work. Have you had to have any nudes and stuff like that? And how do you handle that on set? Because we've had various directors on that have talked about this with us. And mm -hmm. it's just interesting to hear everybody's different um, work, like how they, what they do to make that scene work. Well, I'm extremely professional. I mean, when it comes down to the artwork, like I don't play no games. Like when it comes to dealing with guns and anything like that, way before the crazy stuff was happening, people getting shot on, all of that, I was extremely careful about what I do and what happens to my actors. And anybody who's ever worked with me, they know that I'm very overprotective about them. And so a lot of them go out their way to be like, well, I don't mind, I don't mind it being cold, I don't mind it being like that. I'd be like, no, we're gonna take five minutes, we're gonna go in, you're gonna stand by the heater. I'd be on them like a super parent. So when it comes to um, the nudie scenes, or if I have to do one, Way before I even shoot the scene, I have a talk with both of the actors, depending on who's involved with it. I do a whole breakdown. We have a good talk, like almost like a therapist, because I realized that you can't just rush into something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I haven't had to, I, I'm, as I'm in the industry, I'm starting to work with more professional actors, if you will. Mm -hmm. But when I was first starting off, I was using um, people that I've seen in, um, um, improv clubs and all of that kind of stuff. So it's different. They move different. And you really got to have a conversation with people and find out um, where where their touchy spots are at, if you will, mm -hmm. for lack of better words. You know, you could put your hand on somebody's shoulder and it trigger a horrible memory. So you kind of need to know that ahead yeah. of time before you do a scene like that. That's smart. I don't think anybody said anything that they've gotten that that much in depth with their work. That's true. Yeah, I mean, it's like, um, and then it's not as fun as it is. I thought it was going to be fun to shoot those kind of scenes. It's not. It's so like, 
cookie cutter <laughs> boxes. It's just like, ugh, let's hurry up and get done with this. So it's not as fun as I thought it would be. It's fun to watch it, but it's not fun <laughs> to shoot it. Yeah. No. Yeah. But I'm protective of my actors, so especially the ladies on my set. Very you know, protective I, of them. I'm that's sorry. awesome. Yeah, I often wonder when people have to do work with guns. And I know you have to get the props set up. But mm-hmm. why not have like, okay, we're gonna test the prop before we film, test it, oh, then yeah. get it again, and don't let it leave your sight. I don't understand how these guns are getting replaced and swapped with real weapons. Like it's insane. Is it a conspiracy? Like, is there something happening where people are intentionally doing that to? to I mean, it has to be, right? I, I, I mean, the deeper I go into this industry, the more insane it is the stuff that i hear that 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 actually gets passes i'll be like how did y'all sit here and know this about r kelly and nobody didn't say nothing like harvey White, nobody didn't say nothing like you knew it so it's just like i know when i do in my scene with the guns this right? is why right here well i know it's I, i'm learning it's the money <laughs> whoever has you know, the biggest thickest pockets gets away with shit yeah man it's like um but yeah, we we test the we test the prop weapons out, and I only allow um, sec, um like off duty police officers or people like that to handle my weapons, on on the set. I mean, I only have one person touch my gun. I don't even touch the guns. Hmm. This person right here is the only person in the entire building that touches the guns. So if something happens, we looking at you because I didn't even touch the guns. Right. So I narrow it down to who does it, and we always keep our safety like. I had a scene where we had a shootout scene in my second film. Nobody ever pointed the gun at another individual. I just made sure that the camera was angled in such a way and we edited it in such a way nobody could ever tell. But you was never pointing a gun at a human on set. It never happened. See, I don't understand why that can't. You know what I mean? That seems logical. Mm-hmm. You know, but people just, they don't think about that. And who knows? Like you said, Dicey, it could just be conspiracy. I mean, I mean... I don't know how something like that is accidental, but you know. I, I, you talked about me on break. <laughs> I'm gonna shoot your ass on the next scene. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how you end up with a loaded gun when it's supposed to be a prop. Like I'm confused. Yeah. It's I'm always confused. been a weird. Yeah. yeah. But uh, Gideon, I I do a lot of uh, controversial, hardcore. Um, in your face, getting a rise out of people, going deep into the dark and the depths of, you know. And I know where that's coming from for me. I know what part of me I'm tapping into. I know what that is, you know, what what's in here and what's in here. What are you tapping into? What what is what is it that you're getting out? Where are you digging? Where are you getting this from to get these thoughts and ideas? Tell us Gideon's side, Zip Gideon's story. Okay, scary, scary questions get scarier answers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the Ruach Kodesh. The Ruach Kodesh writes and inspires all of my films and all of my projects. Mm. You know, so it's like, even even with the, the Terra Tinsel Town joint, you know what I'm saying? A lot of times when I'm writing it, I'm just as surprised as if I'm not even writing it. I'm, mm. I'm As I'm writing it, I'm like, what? And she did, what? Ooh, nah, then I had to put it aside and be like, yo, we really gonna put this out? <laughs> and so I come back to it and finish writing it. And so uh, I move out of the way of my story. The story has a way that it wants to communicate to the public. And some stories I have to say, you got to go back to wherever you came from. You can't come out because I understand the importance of when you drop something. First of all, when it's out, it's out. Yeah. And second of all, Look how many people didn't call themselves Scarface since Tony Montana came out and all these different films and projects. Movies affect the world. Mm-hmm. So, all right, when you drop this, I hope you're ready for what comes when you drop it. So I, um, I'm a very spiritual person and I believe in the Most High deeply and the Mashiach most deeply. So I, I listen to how they want me to write these songs and movies and whatever and put them out. That's how they come out. <laughs> that I see you. Did I no, scare you enough? It does. It does make me. Um, you know, it, there's a trigger and other thoughts on that. So you feel like we have a personal responsibility to the viewers 
when they are watching your films, you feel like you are, you want to guide them in some way and you want it to be positive? You, are you trying to put out a positive outlook or are you trying to entertain? What's your, what's your goal? I don't, I don't, it's not my job to control the outcome of what the public does. It's only my job to control what I put out into the world. Whatever you put out to the world, you increase tenfold. So if you're tired of seeing a certain thing, why would you put out a certain thing that increases those images and feelings and everything out into the world? So my only responsibility is to make sure I'm aware of what comes out of my vessel and to the world. It ain't even my, the viewer, Yeah. to the world. Because somebody who didn't even see my movie gonna still be affected by somebody who probably saw it or whatever the case may be, you know? Like, yeah. you know, it goes back to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, what I was saying about Scarface, Tony Montana, you know, uh, well, Superfly. I mean, when Superfly came through and I was talking to some of my elders and they was telling me there's so many people in the grave because they thought they was going to be priests from Superfly. They thought they was going to sell dope and get away with it. So it's like, okay. I'm responsible for what I put out into the world and come with me. I mean, I'm not trying to do no positive teach like some, on some Bill Cosby um <laughs> <picture page. laughs> so there's no message in it there's no intentional message or you don't feel like after you do it that there's that or even your higher consciousness put something in there as a message um even in stupid things there's always a message huh. even in the most dumbest thing that a person puts out there's always going to be a message um, so for me, sometimes I try to find out the message. Sometimes I don't. But then at the end of the day, people don't listen to messages. I mean, people don't listen, especially the more positive it is. Nobody want to hear it. They, they want to hear it when they on their deathbed or somebody got popped. <laughs> they want to find the, find the positive tape and want somebody to send them their book. But um, I, I it's, it's, once again, it's not my control, my job to control not even the message and even who hears it. My job is to make sure I'm telling the story right. That's the only job. Tell the story right. Yeah. You know, because stories change lives. That's that's the biggest thing. Yeah. Stories change lives. So and what would you say out of all the work that you've done, what do you try to, um, not not message-wise, but as far as like the people you choose to work with, the people you choose to put, on the actual um, camera and, and, and film the movie about, do you feel like that, I mean, I mean, basically, I know obviously you're a black man, so you're gonna have black actors, but would you put like transgender people? Would you, you know, like, are you trying to like work on anything like that? Or you try to stick more in the traditional roles in your films? Well, actually, once again, that's why I'm the outlaw of filmmakers. I break all rules that I feel like I need to break. And um, my people from North Africa, you know, I was born here in America, you know what I'm saying? But I'm Yehudi, Yehudayin, you feel me? Like, so it's like, I don't I don't never get caught up in the, block, in the box, the black box. Like I'm a black director, so all of my films have to be black characters. I got a whole Mexican script I just wrote. Mexican, whole Mexican script, you know what I'm saying? Nice. So okay. I just write the story because it's about being a storyteller. So if I got somebody that is a different ethnicity and I got a story written around it, I'm like, cool, let's go with it. In this movie right here, I got four, well, there's really four girls, but I got three exotic dancers. One is a, a Japanese girl, one is a albino, and the other one's um, uh, uh, a black girl from, um, from, Southwest Atlanta and um, Alabama, you feel me? So it's like different kinds of attitudes. And one of the villains is um, Tanzanian, you know? So it's like, um, I tap into the quote unquote voodoo concept, the whole voodoo concept. Yeah, all of that. So all of that's different ethnicities and different cultures. And um, yeah, I don't do the black box. The story just needs to make sense and it needs to be something that I vibe with, you know? Okay. Did you feel like that's that's one of the things that was kind of a part of the Atlanta culture, um, you know, where it's expecting everything to be kind of black centered there in that area? Well, Atlanta's a chocolate city and um, it's just like the, the city itself is very 
um, black entrepreneur, black independent. So it's almost like it, you're not really consciously thinking about it because the whole city just moves you into the department of wanting to tell stories about the culture that you live in. You see where I'm going with it? Okay. So since since it's already an entrepreneur black culture, those are the kind of films that keep emerging out of Atlanta. Mm. But if I were in St. Louis or I was in, um, like Harlem got, has the same kind of spirit as Atlanta, that mm. entrepreneur um, um, African American black centered culture tool with independence. So it just depends on the culture mm. when it, so, uh, to answer your question about Atlanta. Mm. A lot of that stuff is like, uh, <laughs> let me not say that. I don't want to kill my chances. <laughs> <laughs> that was going to be juicy. I caught myself. I caught myself. <laughs> <laughs> what, what made you want to get into filmmaking? Oh, man, it was an accident. It was a straight up accident. I was doing music. Yeah. And then um, I went into about three different like entertainment fields. We did the fashion thing. Then I then I started doing uh, being an author. And then the, the film thing just happened out the clear blue. Mm -hmm. You know, how, I was just, huh? How so? How does that happen out the blue? You ne you didn't never, you know, when you were even being an author or writing, you were writing music? Yes, writing okay. and performing music. Uh -huh. OK, so you have that writing background when you were writing um, uh, music and writing books, you didn't kind of in the back of your head think you wanted to make those into films or anything. How did how did you kind of slip into the filmmaking part by accident? That's OK, so um, <laughs> I, I actually tell the story on, on my documentary series called Into the Mac. You know, I, I talk about it, but in short, I'll say that um, I was in a situation, you know, I would. I'm kind of like a nomad, in other words. I mean, I've been like that since I was born, like a nomad, you know, like almost like a, a military kid. Okay. So I was in this situation where we was in these jacked up hotels. I mean, these hotels were so messed up. <laughs> and um, I was like, I was talking to Alahim. I was like, yo, how are we going to get out this situation? And the response I got back is, we're going to make a movie. And I was like, I don't know how to make a movie. How are we going to do that? And then the response I got back was, just keep thinking on it. And I BS you not, in about two weeks, I wrote my first script. The next week, I hired my first crew. I sat on YouTube all night long, looked at lighting, how to do sound. Next thing I knew, I was doing a movie. Next thing I knew after that, I was getting it shown in a red carpet and premiered in a, in a theater. So my very first time I ever touched the camera and shot a film, it got shown at a red carpet on the theater. And we packed the house. That's and amazing. That's how it happened. But I wasn't, I wasn't, it came from a prayer, a oh. prayer from deliverance out of a situation. And that was the response I got. We're going to make a movie. And that's what kicked off my film career. What's the name of your documentary again? Um, Enter the Mac. Okay. Y'all gotta, y'all gotta watch that Into the Mac. Cause that sounds inspirational. Like, uh, like Master P's story. Like when I hear a story <laughs> about how somebody, you know, came from this and they moved to this, like I, I really pay attention to the steps. And the uh, mentality, because you you had a paradigm shift in there at some point too. It sounds like most definitely for yeah. sure. Does your family come from Bhutan background? No, no. Um, but um, through doing a lot of study and research, I got a chance to uh, dig into it, and um, I found out it wasn't what we've always been taught it was. Mm -hmm. You know. That it's this evil, you know, witchcraft sort of thing. And I was like, oh, no, nah, that's yeah. not what this is. <laughs> oh, HP Lovecraft helped along with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Just, I mean, I, I know a lot of people who practice Wudan. I know some Ephi people, too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it's it's very, I think, helpful. I think it does help guide you a lot more. There's there's a lot more um, communication between you and your effigies and, and your your ancestors, basically. Um, it's, it's definitely a, a, like when people talk about spirituality, it's like an ocean. And it's almost like it's everything in the ocean, seashells and everything. The water even changes temperatures the further you go out and all that. So it's the same way with the spirituality and you connect to the part that suits you. So with, with Voodoo, 
the whole concept of it was the awareness of the invisible world around you. That's what it is. Now you can use it for dark or you can use it for light, but that's what it is. And through it, my ancestors punished the crap out of Western Western society. <laughs> Them Haitian boys, they put the brakes on three empires. The British, the Spanish, and the French kicked they behind. And Haiti's been paying the price since then. They was like, oh, you, you think you're going to show out like that? And they've been hit with an embargo, if you will. They've been cut off almost from international trade and interaction. But that was one of the ways they connected with their ancestors and uh, summoned them. And sometimes I don't want to use the word summon them. They linked with their ancestors through touching with Voodoo and ran circles around their, their army, you know. So that's what made Western society afraid of it. And they started putting it in horror movies, like this big, scary, evil thing, because they couldn't control it. They couldn't understand it. So they just gave it a nasty name and called it the devil stuff. And I was like, yo, that's messed up. <laughs> yeah, you just taught a whole lesson there, though. And and uh, so where do you think this whole turn the other cheek uh, comes from? Uh, so there's, a, you know, the school of thought of revenge is mine um karma and then we have you know turn the other cheek type thing so mm -hmm. uh here in this story they they are obviously getting retribution so like how did we go from getting retribution to well you're just gonna get your reward in heaven <laughs> and, you know what i mean so there's not oh, like there's a lot of indoctrination between here and there so that you know, to keep people in their particular place. Yeah, they, they, we, they, the switcheroo got done to us. You know, they took, <laughs> right. they took the most powerful teachings and then switched them to use them in an oppressive way. You know, so even even when Mashiach was talking about turn the other cheek, he wasn't talking to the world. He was talking to his own people. It was so much beefs and wars going on with his own people. So he was like, your enemies will be those of your own household. So we said, if we going to start our liberation, we got to start by loving one another. So that's what he was talking about, turn the other cheek. And he wasn't talking about metaphorically. He was simply being slapped is one of the most insulting things that can happen to you. So what he is saying is, if somebody does something insulting to you, that's your brother, not your enemy. He talking about your enemies. He's talking about that's your brother or your sister. Learn how to overlook it learn how to look past it learn how to move through it that's what he meant by turning other cheap but it didn't have nothing to do with accepting violence against you and, and just taking it nah but they switched it yeah. <laughs> you feel me so yep 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 and, and we could go we could spend hours just unpacking all that yeah yeah, yeah that's yeah. a that's a, a pretty big that, that we can get real deep on that one but you know our listeners might might listen, but generally speaking, people don't care. They don't. They don't want to hear all that. <laughs> <laughs> the indoctrination yeah. runs deep. No, so, <laughs> I don't know if you guys have heard this uh, through recent polls taken. Uh, Christianity's numbers are dropping. People that identify as Christian is now going down than it's been ever in the history of America. So, are they turning more to spirituality or something else? Well, it was one of those news reports, you know, how they just give you the highlights. Um, I need to do some research and see exactly. But I do know one thing. Um, I, here in Houston, there's a place called the Magic Cauldron. And it's a huge, like, um, store for all different magic type of workings and any kind of spiritual, religious uh, beliefs, including Buddha. And when the pandemic happened and the lockdown, <clears throat> they were literally almost making $1,000 a day because people were just... They were done. They're like, I need to see something in my hands. I need yeah. to do something. Like, I need to sage some shit. Like, I need something. <laughs> so mm -hmm. people were just flocking into the shop. So I find it's interesting. Three years later, or two and a half years later, now we're seeing, you know, oh, maybe it's, maybe it's trickling down. You know, people are tired of being told, pray and it's going to work. We're where they just lit a candle with intention and all of a sudden what they wanted happened. They're like, hmm. <laughs> well, I stay here too for anybody listening where, you know, this is my disclaimer. Nobody's saying whatever you, you know, you believe in is bogus or whatever. You, you do you. 
uh, we're just talking about, you know, some some of the teachings that's running in the background, and um, and it's a, a healthy debate or a healthy discussion to be had. And uh, but nobody's telling you to stop doing what you're doing or berating what you're doing. You know, do what works for you, and and follow your your heart, your whatever tell whatever beliefs you have that um, you know work uh, for you. Yeah. I'm not, yeah, definitely. I always, I always have to say that. <laughs> Salute to whatever you're doing, care. pushing you forward. Right. That's not yeah. destroying another life. Salute. Right. Straight up. Well, I tell you what, for me personally, when I did, I don't have it up right now, but when I had my um my Santa Morta statue up with my ancestral things around her and I left offerings, my life seemed to work a lot smoother. <laughs> it has been lately, so I might need to get that shit back together. <laughs> well, I tell you this though, you know, I, I got to sit back and laugh and smile sometimes because people now remember what I, I was describing spirituality as the ocean. Now people jumping in the ocean and ain't never took a bath before. You know, so now they want to split splash in the bath and swim, but you got a lot of things that's waiting in that ocean for you that you didn't know was there. You know, you didn't yeah, go to school yeah. for this. You know, so you got a lot of stuff waiting on you that you thought you knew what it was about. And now you got something stuck to you that you can't get off. Now you're looking like the Baba Doc or the Baba Duke. Or the Baba Duke. <laughs> now, now you well, out I mean, like, like, um, whatever her name was on, on Phantasm. You out here looking crazy. You, you, you yeah. your life messed up because now you got connected to something you didn't, you didn't have no business messing with. So, and and that's the other thing too, right? You anytime, and I, and this is my disclaimer as a, as a spiritual person. Everybody knows here I'm, I'm a, pract a practitioner of the of the craft. Um, you cannot really and truly have power if you are not willing to be the cause in your life. So if you're going to sit there and say, well, I didn't do that. That was just, uh, you know, you made me upset or, you know what, I, I, I'm, I've always been the victim in these relationships and I've never done anything wrong and nothing that, I mean, if you can't take some responsibility for everything in your life, your power will slip through your fingers and you will end up becoming not necessarily a puppet of, but you will become something else that's bigger than you you'll be the you'll be the, the control of that it'll be in, i mean it'll be in control of you because you are not willing to be responsible so you're willing to say and that's with every every any type of religion if you are like oh you know please absolve me of these sins or please you know take away and it doesn't matter what anything or anyone tells you if you can't sit there and go i kicked that dog that was my fault you know like, for example, I'll give y'all an example, So, because I sound kind of crazy right now. <laughs> three weeks three weeks ago, I accidentally splashed myself in the eye with some uh, water that had a dog bone in it that I had just picked up. <clears throat> it still had flesh on it. And I was putting it in the bath to start degreasing and taking away all the stuff. Because my, I make bone things, and I wanted to give this animal a new purpose because it had been killed on the side of the road. Well, I don't think that dog was very happy when it died. And I did not ask any permission. And I'm Native. I have a, over almost 30% Native blood. And years, a few years back, I did the shaman thing. And ever since then, I feel like that's been really awakened in me. And so I was like, oh, my God, this dog was angry. <laughs> and I didn't even ask permission. And I should have asked. So I was very, very ill. I was extremely sick. And that's why... You can probably even hear it in my voice right now and why I'm wearing this, because I really feel like even my skin is not correct yet. Um, mm. But I ended up red saging it and releasing the animal spirit. And then I took the bones back to be with the rest of it because I felt like, you know what? That was irresponsible of me. And I did that to you. And I apologize. I didn't kill you and I wouldn't have killed you. I have a million rescued animals in my home now to prove it. But, you know, I do respect your life and your life force. So please be free and rest in peace. Mm -hmm. So I took responsibility for what I did in that situation. And what did that do for me? To me, I feel like I have been able to retain the power spiritually of who I am because I am right with myself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah, it does. It does. 
also so because this is our first um our first episode that we've recorded since you were ill so um i know you're you you think you're hiding but actually i think that's what <laughs> look you look like a grieving widow but you know given what we talk about and everything is perfect <laughs> Working. Yeah, I thought it was stylish. Like, yeah. hey, I didn't know. I thought it was your swag. <laughs> well, it is. It usually is. But yeah, she's got a hat on. She's got a brim hat with a net coming down. You know how she she has the Ouija board on the wall behind her and her dolls and all that. But thanks for sharing that story, Chantel. Uh, and uh, also, since we last met, you had um, a cat to pass, right? Yes, my 19 year old girl passed. Yeah, we talk about our furry animals on here all the time. What did you decide to do with those bones? You know what? I just buried her and I'm going to let her be. I'm going to put a nice little stone over her. I had her for almost 20 years. I mean, she was pretty much a person in this household. <laughs> you know, <laughs> she was like, yeah. So did she, have, I mean, that was one tough girl. Do you have any fur babies, Gideon? Oh, uh, no, nah, no. Nah. What is you that? You want a cat? We'll ship you one. We got a ton of cats. <laughs> What's that? I like fish. You? Yeah, some fish. <laughs> yeah, in the freezer. <laughs> in the freezer. What's what's that behind you? I've been looking behind you. What's what's your? So, so this is like this is this is a steel shot from my um from a film. Oh. oh, okay. Oh, nice. Yeah, that is nice. Let me lift it on up so the public can enjoy. Yeah. yeah. Steel shot. Right. What are you drinking on? Some water. You know how you do interviews and your and your throat just suddenly gets dry as a desert, your nose and everything. So you just be like, listen, yeah. I'm ready this time. Let's get it. <laughs> well, are you planning to have a uh, first off? Are you planning to come back to Houston Horror Film Festival next year? Mm. Mm. I don't think so. Texas was cool, man, but it was so doggone hot out there. <laughs> <laughs> I was dripping wet like somebody had poured and doused water on my head and i was just like you know what i think i might be good with this ah, so um <laughs> read a film next year you know I, I i see how it goes you know what i'm doing with this um with this tits and zombies i got such a marvelous plan with it till um shoot i'm i'm thinking beyond trying to show it in a film festival that bad boy is gonna be in y'all theaters okay. it's gonna be on y'all billboards We'll and see it, I'm sure. What's your zombie inspiration? Do you, what, what what zombie films or or shows do you like most? Wow. Um. Hmm. Well, I always loved Twenty Eight Days Later. I always loved it. Just the whole cuss up and how those zombies was moving. Yeah. Um. Of, of course, you know. Um. The great Romero. You know, all of his joints was great. Um, I liked um, Rod, uh, Robert Rodriguez's joint. Yeah, if you like them fast moving like that, you gotta watch the Korean films. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, the yeah. train to Busan. Yeah, and it's like, uh, I mean, zombie zombie films is, are are cool. You know, I just feel like that's another reason I was doing mine because um, you never seen somebody from my culture really do a, a zombie film. Right. You yeah. can't really think of one, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I was like, let me do it first. And I, um, really, my zombies are dead souls. They're not really dead. They're um, the um, the witch doctor, quote unquote, witch doctor is controlling their souls. Okay. So he's he's what he's what he does is he put a ritual on them, and so he's kind of like choking their souls from the inside, which is causing their bodies to carry out this effect. So they're more like puppets. Yes. You know, and that's how the, that's how the original uh, uh, sorcerers would do it. Mm-hmm. You know, those people weren't really dead. They would have some type of way that um, some type of fish or some type of something that they used to actually um, keep those people in a frame of mind where they were totally under their control. So I just kind of took it back to that, to the origin of that. Oh, nice. I'm uh, too bad you're not filming in Houston. I'd want to uh, see what I could do to help, you know, PA style or something. And she's got lots of tits. <laughs> I'm saying that's a PA. <laughs> I always got to well, bring know, those girls up. <laughs> you know, I, I, I could always use a pair of help, <laughs> of help or persistence in, in PR. In PR. <laughs> there is a, 
lot. There's a lot better pair, younger pairs. <laughs> Girl, shoot. <laughs> Nothing wrong with an experienced pair, an experienced <laughs> pair of, uh, of PR, PR people. You know, <laughs> you need those kind of people on your team. Nice. I love so, it. Um, uh, well, uh, of that $6.8 million uh, budget, how much is going towards the pairs? <laughs> well, you know what? A smart man sends, uh, has a lot of money set to the side for his PR, for his promotion. Yeah. You want to put all your money into getting the film produced and then can't get it out to the public and nobody even know it exists. So you need a strong advertising and promotional team without question. So exactly. a lot of budget set aside for that. And you are that's a gem that I'm that I'm actually because I have books and I'm just now realizing that I need to spend a whole lot more time and money on the marketing aspect. It's a business. Mm -hmm. just, you could be a creative and everything, but if you could, you can even write the best book. I'm not saying I'm the best writer, but you can write the best book. And if nobody knows that it's there or not enough people knows it, it won't, it won't matter. It just, it's just a book that's on the shelf. So that marketing mm -hmm. and promotion part is, uh, is a hell of a, of a, a part. It, it's just as strong. Like it's just as important in order Absolutely. to, it, it's gotta be great, but then it's gotta get out there. So. Get in, it sounds like you are well on your way to achieving everything you want, and I'm I'm here for it. I can't wait to see it happen. Appreciate it. Appreciate it a whole lot. Definitely. Any, any other creatures that you really, really like to, to see or to have in your films? Anything clowns or vampires <laughs> or yeah. I, I actually got uh I got some joints, man. Like my next couple of joints, like gonna be some horror movies. So, I got a movie where I'm concentrating around dragons. Oh, okay, yeah. They're not gonna be your regular looking dragons. They're gonna be some totally different, almost like on some some aliens. The way yeah. those um, the creations look, it's gonna look like that. Hmm. And then um, I got a demon possession movie I wanna do, and a, nice. a, a yeah. what else? A clown movie. This is my this is my clown movie. It's called um, <laughs> Daddy Took Us to the Circus. <laughs> oh, okay. Now, would that be Daddy as in like biological <laughs> Daddy, or are we talking about like Daddy Dumb? I mean, you know. Now it's talking about it's talking about some it's talking about some Mama went on vacation and trusted the Daddy to do the right thing by taking care of the kids, and he had this great idea to just go to some random place and the kids picked the circus. When they went to this circus, it wasn't your regular circus. <laughs> I was surprised that they had more clowns than than that often. It's like, why are so many clowns here? <laughs> like like Hellfest was that the name of yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, with uh, Tony Todd, Hellfest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. How, so what are the like, age of these children though? Yeah, I, I got them real young because I want to make people look at it and be like, yo. Dang, how are these kids gonna survive? I got a, like a, a three year old, a 10 year old, and a 13 year old. You know, I think I wanna make them all girls and then the dad. And they gotta fight all of these clowns. <laughs> oh boy. If you wanna clowns, terrify, yeah, if you wanna terrify people, put people in very vulnerable, vulnerable, oh, okay, I'm getting tongue tied, vulnerable positions like kids and the elderly or people who are disabled. That is terrifying. And and I'm gonna tell you a personal favorite for me that really gets me is when they're pregnant. Yeah, I was about to say. Oh. Yeah, that that's so terrifying because I know how vulnerable that is, and I I felt so like when I was pregnant, I felt like I, I was just so terrified, and I wanted you know just to protect my baby so much that it was. Well, I mean, both times, well, all three times, lost one. But anyway, long story. So, uh, <laughs> just the 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 idea of. Uh, anything being able to attack. That's why a, a quiet place is one of them that is was so terrifying to me because she's in there, she's pregnant, and they can't make a sound. You know what I mean? So those are the ways to really get people when you put somebody in a vulnerable position. Vulnerable position. I can't say vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of syllables in there. <laughs> you need some water? <laughs> you need some water. <laughs> I do, I do. Okay, so look. So since you have a tits and zombies, are you gonna do a dicks and zombies? Mm. <laughs> I'm not a fan of dicks. <laughs> I'm a fan of my own. <laughs> I'm a fan of my own. That's it. 
Unless it's starring me. Like if, if it's starring me as the lead, then I do one. <laughs> and the intro, the intro will be just like this. <laughs> like, I like this. Okay, for, for our listening audience who can't see, um, he, it had a logo. It had the logo at the bottom. His, his water bottle across the screen. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. Not, I know I'm yapping, so. No, no, you're fine. No, I'm excited. This has been a great conversation. Yeah. Do you have merch? Where can I get one of those T-shirts? Oh, guess what? I bet you you can go on www theoutlawfilmmakers.com. I bet you that. And then when you get there, I bet you then you can go to the merchandise section mm -hmm. and then you can purchase. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the tits and zombies on there yet. <laughs> Which one you think I want? I want you <laughs> but this is the key to advertisement. You see how I'm on the only one who's wearing it? And the more that I'm the only one who has it, more people want it. Then I sell it. That's how that goes. Okay. But I have <laughs> I have other um, hats and stuff on there from my other films. Yodi, um, I think I'm gonna start reing up my collection. Put Black Pope and a whole lot of other stuff on there. Nice. So, which film did you enjoy enjoy making the most? Wow, that's a real, real good question. Oh man, the most, the most, the most, the most. <laughs> I want to say this one: the 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 um, Terror in Tinseltown, the proof of concept. Because just putting the proof of concept together, um, it's only like 15% of what the feature gonna look like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was just thrilled by how it turned out. And then I was like, if they love it, and they, and they are, man, I'm gonna have awards up the roof. Like I'm gonna change the horror film industry for good when I drop this feature, word on everything. So I had so much fun because I enjoyed the team. I liked the concept. I like to see the monsters and stuff get painted and everything like that. And then everybody just had a good vibe on set, man. And it was just uh, a real bond with I've the crew. I've heard that horror. Yeah, horror just, it's so much fun. People always say it's so much fun to film. It's not like what you see. It's like, it could go either way. It could go either way. But how I've always experienced it was, it's fun. And it's, it's less... It's less scary to make... No, it's less scary to watch than it is to make. I'll put it like that. And the reason why I put it like that is like certain scenes when you're seeing people doing all of that screaming and stuff like that, <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it, it kind of affects you. But when I, I can watch it all day on TV, you know, big deal. Yeah. But be in the actual zone where you're doing it. Mm. And then the funny part is you might slit somebody's throat on scene just like as a film character doing some special effects and they screaming and hollering. And then you say, cut, and everybody start laughing. That shit. <laughs> It's just, it's just a mind freak because he was like, "Dang, we just got through snatching his guts out," and we laughed about it. Right. Well, listen, right. I'm gonna tell you, when you start filming that demon one, people are gonna be scared. So just remember that. <laughs> I don't know what it is about making films about stuff like that, but people freak out on the set. They just freak out. Yeah, I'm gonna have so much gospel music playing. Change <laughs> <laughs> the place. <laughs> I'm gonna the walls and everything. I think I'm joking. <laughs> Still out the north walls. We gonna have prayer worship. Then we gonna do the movie. <laughs> you know what? When I the first time I saw you was in um, a panel, um, the the horror filmmakers panel where they were dropping tips and talking about their experiences on set. And you were asking some really good questions in here, in the in that room in that panel. Do you remember that? The mm -hmm. panel? Okay. Uh, what was, was there anything, being a filmmaker yourself, was there anything that you learned that you did not already know from that panel? Hmm. That people will protect their franchise. That's the one thing I learned. <laughs> they gonna protect their franchise and they don't care nothing about the public not wanting to see no more of it. They're gonna come out with Halloween 25. They're gonna come out with <laughs> Texas Chainsaw Massacre 100. Like they don't care, they're gonna protect the franchise. Yeah. I learned that. I learned that um, you know, I learned mostly really not um informational stuff, but more stuff like let go and um enjoy the outcome. Mm. Like you don't have to go 
and just find the right person and shake the hand and make the deal. Like, yo, just let go and actually just enjoy the experience and enjoy yourself and see what comes out of it. And this is what came out of it, me doing an interview with y'all. <laughs> right, that's right. This is so fun. We, um, because I don't think I talked to you then. We talked in the lobby. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I remember seeing you in there and the questions that you were asking. Um, so, you know, it was like, okay, you know what he's talking about, for sure. Uh, I recently started my own production company, Spicy Dicey Productions, LLC. So, um, so I've, I've, been, I've been listening and acquiring a lot of information. And, and um, so, you know, I was listening to a lot of what you were saying also in there. But um, so when I go to any of these events, like I don't just go and look at the tables or anything. Um, I don't just go and talk to the celebs. Like I am legit in the screening, uh, watching the movies. I am in the panels, listening to the discussions. Like there's so much knowledge, especially from an independent standpoint, to learn how the process of filmmaking goes. So, you know, uh, that's a tidbit for whoever is interested in filmmaking. You should go to some of these festivals. You can learn a lot of information. There's a lot of people yeah. who've already been where you are in the process that you're trying to get to. You can learn a lot from them. Did you network with some other people? Or, uh, you know, obviously we talk, but I mean, other people that you have established a relationship with or can collaborate with from that? A- absolutely. I am. I am trying to be. I hate the word trying. Yeah. I am aiming to be the the networking prince, the prince of networking. So I go through. I meet people, I shake hands, and I see um, how can we correspond together. Yeah. It's not always about take, 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 what can I get from you? That's lame. It's like, how can I assist you in what you are doing? Okay. You know, so I, I talked to a lot of people, and um, the, the one thing that kept tripping me out was the advice they was giving in some of these panels. Mm-hmm. I was just like, bro, that's so outdated. The advice you just gave this person is so outdated. I know it because I've been in this thing seven years and, and learned it scraping my knees and elbows like I learned it you know so man I just got to shake my head because the the journey the journey is worth if you don't even make it the journey is worth everything yo even if you don't make it you can package your journey all your failed expenses and sell it for millions because the journey got all the wisdom all the gain so I can listen to him present them all outdated books to those people and I felt bad for her. And I walked up to the young lady afterwards and said, this is the book you need to read. What's that? And I was like, when he told you not going to like, wait, back what's up, what's the book? <laughs> what's that book? Oh, let me see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gideon, what's the book? <laughs> let's dig into it. Now, you see, I'm not getting paid for this. That's another rule to the game. You don't promote folks if you're not getting paid. Okay, that's fine. You can tell me after okay. uh, later. So, I help him out. This is this is me being a generous cat. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, the reason I ask is because I'm always thinking in terms of our listeners. Some are are professionals or or want, you know, they're they're working towards being in the industry. Some are being entertained. So there's so many different people are coming from so many different standpoints that I want them all to get something out of it. So some people are just listening because they want to be entertained and we <laughs> we act cool on here. Uh, by the way, my parents are here from North Carolina, so that's why I, I've toned it down a little bit tonight. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, because she didn't ask you about your penis Yeah, I, I didn't encourage It was not pretty amazing. I'm a home. <laughs> but I'm some, a home. some of them are just listening for the idiocies that come out of our mouth, and they're enjoying that. But then some people are listening to learn stuff. So when I ask stuff like that, it's really just to try to, to help people, just to educate them on something that they can take away from a from uh with more knowledge and, and i don't have no problem with doing that a lot of people in this industry they scared to share knowledge because it's competitive and if you know what they know then it's like oh he's gonna knock me out the box and all of that listen after you learn the skills of boxing it depends on your skill now your talent your own particular pizzazz that you add to the skill That's right. i mean so if somebody else come through and they beat you that means you just went a better fighter i don't care about sharing the knowledge because i'm gonna do what i'm gonna do i know yeah. i know what i'm good at and I know you, got, you got a built-in audience because everybody loves tits. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't love this movie. Come on, what's not to like? You got four strippers. If you're if you're not into black girls, well, guess what? I got Asian girl. If you ain't into Asian girl, guess what? I got an albino chick. If you ain't into, I got all kinds. And then guess what? 
Y'all gonna like this character. His name is Dick Bang Dyke. <laughs> Listen, you gotta tap into your Traumaville. This has a real Traumaville vibe to it. You know what I'm saying? So he's, he sets up and arranges these VIP parties. Okay. Mm-hmm. So he invites all these Hollywood superstars and all these people to his VIP party. And everybody knows him, but he's a retired adult film star. And he has he does fetish films. Mm-hmm. And so studs is his fetish. That's what he's into. <laughs> so he's made a he's made a reputation by doing those kind of films. Nevertheless, all of my characters in some way, somehow, could basically even be spin-offs. They are all zany characters. And that is the bulk of what my film genre is. I created my own film genre called Black Pope. And it's dark and zany stories about anti-heroes with proverbial endings. So I'm always going to tell the craziest, most zaniest, most outrageous story. And then it's going to end with a proverbial lesson. That's it. Mm-hmm. So um, trying to find this book. Um, okay. It's all right. Uh, I was, so I, I was, was laughing. Good? Uh, No, when he was saying his character used to to do adult entertainment, he did um, fetish films. Immediately, I thought of uh, Nate. Nate? Uh, Oh, Nathan Uh, Broadhead? Yes, Nathan Broadhead. Yeah. Because that's pretty much what he's, his whole career now. I mean, he was adult industry, and he did fetish for a long time. And he's trying to get into stuntman work, though, but yeah. I'm telling you, that's why people are gonna love this story because it's true. I didn't even know that. You talk about Nate. I mean, come on, he's he sounds to me like the character. I don't even know this. That's character. what I'm saying. Yeah. That's yeah. what's so funny. Oh, Nathaniel Bronson. We did a two hour show with him. He's hilarious. Oh man, I bet you. I I um on my other films, I work with people who are in the dope film industry, like one or two who had previously done those kind of films. And to hear their stories is, oh my man, it's outrageous. I mean, you you hear about sponges getting lost and all type of wild stuff. It's just, it's crazy stuff. But um, um, you know, they're they're brother and sister industries, the adult film industry and the uh, Hollywood film industry. You know, they know each other, and it's like the adult film industry is like the not not talked about stepchild. It's like you you got to go in the closet when the family come when guests come on, but everybody know you, you know. So, um, but yeah, it, 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 and it seems to be so difficult for them to cross, you know, to cross over. Mm-hmm. Well, to cross over this way anyway. If you're an adult film, they don't take it seriously as an yeah, actor. yeah. It's, oh, it's, absolutely. fans. <laughs> <laughs> It's got to be a real finesse. It's got to be a, a real skill with with how you do it. And uh, just like the movie X, I think that was brilliant how he tied that story in and then it wasn't too over the top. And um, they're not, you know, now that I think about it, I was, I was doing my research to try to find how many um, um, sensual slash horror films were there, like they were actually themed that way you know yeah sex and horror is definitely taboo that's why <laughs> and that's why we do it <laughs> yeah that's why we do it trying to break the stereotypes break the taboos so which one of y'all was in the adult film when y'all came up with this title <laughs> like who came up with the title well you know i think it was both of us together because dicey does erotic and horror writing I okay. do a lot of horror writing, um, and I only throw in erotic if I need it. I'm not. I focus a lot on the horror, and so and fantasy, like urban fantasy. And so um, I was just like, "Well, sex sells," so <laughs> we came up with sex and horror. I like it. I, I like the ring to it. You know, I like the the title to it and everything for sure. Thank I, you. I like uh, being in the trenches. The gutters in the places <laughs> where there's now I will say this and people Dicey does have a profile on the porn hub. <laughs> a word? <laughs> okay. What I is- know. 
but now that we're at an hour, <laughs> we're a little over an hour. Gideon, it was so wonderful to have you on. Can y'all see that? Can y'all? I can't see it, can you? Uh, it's not that, that's not the way it works. No nonsense. His name is, I think it's Bob Sands. Oh, Bob Sands. Sands. Sands? Sorry, man. Sands. Yeah. This book right here, um, and there are programs that a person could be a part of that that would teach them a lot of this stuff about invest, how to get investors and all that old kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? But you got to sign up for memberships. Yeah. But um, that's definitely my next route. I'm going to have a big, huge module, and I'm going to have all awesome. this. Awesome. <laughs> I heard of a, a, a site today called TradeShare. Okay. And it's people that go on there that know a trade and you can sign up for it. And I think you get like a free month and you can learn whatever people know specifically. They share something that they know on the, on the website and you guys can swap back and forth with your knowledge. Yeah, I'm going to check that out. Well, trade this, share. this has been a wonderful discussion, Gideon. I'm so glad that we had a chance to meet and I'm glad that we were able to connect to come on here. Well, you've been, con you've been communicating with Chantel via social media, but I mean, I'm glad that you all were able to schedule some time so we could come on here and talk about this. I'm so yeah. looking forward to your films and, um, and just the process, like you were saying about, um, enjoying the process i'm in i'm looking forward to you going through the whole process um from beginning to end and then i want to see the finished product but i'm i'm looking forward to all the things that you learn and the the wonderful experiences you have along the way i think that'll be great also because you have such a positive and great outlet and i don't want to use the word positive and not, not the toxic positivity stuff i mean like you have a, an outlook that you can't fail that way you know yeah. what I mean? Like you, you're, you are going head first into what you know you should be doing. You are paving your way. Yes. And there, there is no way you can fail. Like either way you win. So yeah. that's marvelous. Appreciate that. Straight up, straight up. And, uh, it's informed young man. It's <laughs> informed because I want to follow. I want to know what's happening. Yeah. I tell us where that we can find you. Yeah. Well, well, this is what you can do. And to all the listeners out there, if you're still on board, I need y'all to go to uh, check for the H in Zombie stands for horror. That's what I call this four part documentary series that is showing the step by step as I'm building this film to get it turned into a feature. So that's going to be on Amazon Prime. You're going to you're going to see us make the zombies live. Um, you're going to see us um, break down the characters and why the characters are called what they're called and all of that. So um, it's just an interesting way to see a director go from taking a project from this stage to taking it to the next stage that you will see it go um, when, it, when it goes to its next level nationally and internationally, uh, Alaheem willing. So, um, and again, I, I definitely look to uh, still connect with you ladies and, 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 and pull some game from you all too, learn some things from you all too as well, definitely. Absolutely, tell everybody where they can find you on social media and online. Yo, I'm getting off of Facebook because I'm tired of blocking me and it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> So right now I'm on Instagram at um the Outlaw of Filmmakers. And um uh, make sure y'all put the outlaw of filmmakers, you know. And then um I'm on Twitter as the outlaw D A outlaw. But I just got on there, so I only got like 10, one, two followers or something like that. But I'm gonna I'm gonna beat that up. On Twitter? Yeah, I just got on that. And then um Twitter? Interesting on Twitter. I know what people get Twitter for when you're gonna put anything. Oh yeah, I, I come to Twitter to talk my ish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna talk it loud too. Okay. And then um I'm gonna get on TikTok once I get this. I got some coal I'm gonna put on TikTok, but I need to make some more moves before I do that. So I'm gonna be on TikTok soon enough. But um that's where you can find me at and on my website, even when I demolish all my social media pages, because I hate social media. Um You'll still find me at my website. It's www.theoutlawfilmmakers.com. All my merchandise, all my films, my whole filmography, all of that is on there. Wonderful. Great. Nice. Wonderful. Thank you so much. No doubt. No doubt.